Another way we might have of measuring or indexing inequality is to look at the relative visibility or audibility of men and women within journalism. Going back only a few decades to the 1980s, there was a widespread assumption in broadcast journalism that women's voices were wrong and that if a woman were to read the news, no one would believe it. In a 2019 programme called The Reunion, the BBC brought together some of the first female newsreaders in the UK and they talked about their experiences. Some recalled being mocked, others were asked why they were taking a job that a man could do, some were told they should be at home with their children. Almost all talked about the pressure to look both attractive and authoritative. Often, by reading the news, female journalists found that they became the news with endlessly circulating stories about supposed, completely fictional rivalries between different female presenters and comparisons about what they wore, what they looked like, how they did. This kind of scrutiny has intensified rather than reducing over the years, with women under intense forensic surveillance in relation to body shape, size, hair, makeup and dress. The move towards more informal presentation styles, such as walking in a studio or leaning on a desk rather than sitting behind it, has added pressure on women to wear high heels and tight, body-revealing clothes. In fact, some TV companies have rules that a woman presenter must not repeat the same outfit within 30 days. The increased visibility of women on our screens does not necessarily mean cause for celebration then. For example, a standard news presentation format pairs a man and a woman, but more often than not, this means an older, heavyweight male and a younger, attractive female, 20 or 30 years his junior, and billed as the junior partner. This heteronormative pairing is problematic in many ways, reinforcing the common idea of a screen husband and wife in which the men get most of the best lines. The increased visibility of women journalists on screen is deeply shaped by ageism as well as sexism, with a preponderance of young women and markedly fewer women over 50. Several women have been fired from presenting positions when they no longer looked young and glamorous. Miriam O'Reilly, who won an age discrimination case against the BBC, noted that it was her age and appearance that led to her being fired, not her ability to do the job. Other presenters have been advised to have some work done, lighten their hair colour or wear brighter colours. The organisation Women in Journalism has been studying questions of women's visibility for many years. They've shown that women in newspapers are often seen, not heard, with pictures of young, attractive women being used to give pages a lift, even if they have a tenuous relation to the story being reported. That is, women often become visible by being presented as attractive objects for consumption. Looking specifically at the visibility of female journalists, they conducted an analysis of newspaper front pages in 2017 and found that women had only 25% of the bylines. In other words, that three quarters of the paper's leading stories were still authored by men. This fits with TV news, where women are much more likely to report or present soft news, something that is so well established that it has been caricatured as the male news hound versus the female news bunny. Of course, it's not just gender that has an impact. As we can see from the module on intersectionality, gender also intersects with other characteristics such as race and ethnicity, class and disability in relation to who gets jobs in journalism, how senior they become and what they're paid. A study from the US supports this intersectional analysis, highlighting the fact that at the LA Times, women of colour in full-time journalistic roles earned less than 70 cents for every dollar earned by a white man even in similar roles. As in other fields, class background, sexual orientation and disability also play a major role in who succeeds as a journalist. Sociologist Sam Friedman argues that there is a class ceiling shaping access to jobs across the media, alongside better documented gender and race inequalities. There's also a striking cisgender bias in the profession 
despite positive moves, such as the hiring of Paris Lees as a columnist for Vogue, and the recent appointment of non-binary writer, filmmaker and activist Al Fisher to the Metro newspaper in the UK. For people with disabilities trying to break into journalism, the challenges can be even harder due to entrenched ignorance, stereotyping and disabilism, that is, discrimination against disabled people. In the UK, 13% of the population has a disability, but only 1% of people working within media are disabled. Many countries now have laws that require employers to make reasonable adjustments to the work environment or tasks to enable people with disabilities to take up opportunities, but all too often employers still favour non-disabled applicants with the justification that journalism is a tough, fast-paced industry. Change is slow, but larger organisations are making changes in a climate that is becoming gradually more welcoming to all kinds of diversity. The BBC, for example, has what it calls a new talent disability recruitment portal called BBC Extend, designed to increase the numbers of disabled people working there. Why do these inequalities matter? Well, at one level, this is simply a matter of social justice, of basic fairness. And this would be the case in any industry. But more than this, in an occupation like journalism, it's crucial that a diverse range of people make the news because these are the stories and perspectives that shape our understanding of the world. If those stories are dominated by men or by white people or by non-disabled people, then journalism is not reflecting the real diversity of people and perspectives. It's only capturing part of the story. Watch this interview with Liv Little, who set up Galdem, and make a note of at least three reasons why diverse journalistic voices are important. In the creation of Galdem, I think for me on a really personal level, like the reason why I wanted to start it, start it and I wanted to connect with with people, with women, with women and non-binary people of colour was because I needed a network. I needed to find some women who shared in my experiences and who I could connect with. I desperately needed it. I was in a really low kind of place just thinking, you know, is this what, is this what um, my university experience is going to be about? Is this what life and, you know, media and everything is going to be about? I think it's incredibly important that we've carved out a space for ourselves, that we are in control of that narrative. For a lot of us that work in media, specifically for those who work in journalism um, and in the media landscape, there is an expectation as a woman of colour or as a black woman that I always want to be commenting on issues pertaining to race and or gender. <laughs> um, anything black woman related, I, you know, I must want to talk about Meghan Markle, I must want to talk about um, certain kinds of topics. And it's incredibly frustrating and I think you know, the point of Gaudem is demonstrating that our interests are far-reaching. So yes, while sometimes I might want to um, write about my race, my sexuality or my gender, actually I have a lot of varied interests and I would like to be commissioned or asked to write about things outside of that quite limited construct of, of what people assume our interests are. If I look at my peers, if I look at the women that I work with who are amazing, and I, and I look at the women, um, the women that I know and the collectives and things that I know, all of their wor work is born out of filling a gap. Um, but they're producing really fun, really interesting, really vibrant ways to address this kind of lack of representation. And I think, yeah, creativity has provided a, an excellent kind of platform outlet. And historically, it always has been. The number one tip that I always give people is literally finding your kind of like tribe, finding the right people who will challenge you, who will help you, who will advise you, who will support you, who will be there to wipe your tears, who will be there to celebrate with you when things go correctly. Um, yeah, find, find, find the right group of people. In order to be successful, you have to throw a lot of things out there. Some things will stick and some things won't stick. And that's not a reflection on you being an awful person. That, that commissioner might have poor taste or, or your idea might not have been, um, might not have been fully formed or, you know, or what they, or, or what they were looking for. Um, but I think it's important to, 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 to keep put, putting yourself out there even when you, when, when things go, when things go, yeah wrong. I think often when you're first welcome into certain spaces you feel as though it's your privilege to be occupying that space when in reality those people are inviting you in because they need to hear they need to hear your voice. We are important 
Um, and we have a vital role to play in kind of shaping culture, shaping politics, shaping the discourse, shaping narrative. I think understanding that your voice is powerful because it is, it is powerful and it's necessary. Thank you.